one of the first days I was working in Harlem, I was just getting kind of situated, trying to learn, learn whatever I could learn. And I'm walking down the street, and this kid says to me, kid, I was, how old was I? I was uh, 24, almost 25. He was probably 23, 22. He says to me, what the hell are you doing here? Ooh. And so I went over to him. I didn't feel threatened or afraid at all. I just, I went over to him. I said, you know what? I always felt like if you're angry, if you're angry, that means you're sensitive. Because I would have been angry too if I were a black person in this country. Uh -huh. I'd, I'd have been very angry. I was angry anyway as a white person about racism. I'd have been really angry if I were a black person. So when, when I saw somebody's anger, and instead of like being afraid of it or being challenged by it, it was like, I get that, you know? My thing was, if you're angry, you're sensitive. If you're sensitive, you're the kind of person I want to get to know. So I walked over to him and I said to him, look, I'm not here to try to tell you what to do in your life. I don't, I don't know enough. I'm here because I do care about people and I want to share with you whatever I've learned and hear whatever you have to share with me about what you've learned. And that's, that's what I'm about. And he liked that and we, we became fast friends. I ended up being best man at his wedding a year or so later. Wow. Uh, so that was my attitude though. Uh, same thing happened, uh, uh, that was Billy Taylor. He died young, he died of leukemia. He wasn't even 30. What? But we, we, uh, we were good friends for a few years until then. Another example that happened real quick was there were these two guys, Pepsi and Lucky, and I sure wish I could find them. I doubt if they're alive now. Lucky might be. Pepsi, I'm quite sure, wouldn't be. But I met them. They were, they were heroin addicts and winos. And I, used, I don't like describing people with labels. They were human beings. They were good guys who happened to be heroin addicts and have a, a, drinking, a drinking problem too, alcoholics. Because I saw them as human beings, and interacted with them respectfully. And they could tell I liked them. And I wasn't talking down to them. So because of that, they said to me, and they knew I wanted to learn. So they said, you know, you're different. So come with us, we're gonna show you how we shoot up. And they took me down to the basement of this abandoned building and they showed me how they took this bottle cap and put the heroin in it. Excuse me, you know, you know where female shelter at around here? Female shelter? They said 107, my sister, 107 from Broadway. There is a shelter, I don't know if it's particularly female, but there's a shelter, maybe 237. It's that way on the left. You see where that blue thing is hanging? Yeah. It's, I think, somewhere around there. All right, thank you. But look around, might not be right there. Anyway, so they, you know, they showed me how they cooked it up. Took, they took a match out, they warmed it up. They showed me how they put the thing around the arm. You know, they did the whole thing. Stuck the needle in. All the time, they're saying, not all the time, but they made it clear while they're showing me this, we are only showing you because you want to learn and because you like us and we like you. They said, don't ever do this. Do not ever do this. Why not? <laughs> you know? No, I mean, really, they, they cared about me. The same, they knew I cared about them. It was oh. like a mutual respect. You know, we're showing you this because you want to learn. But a lot of the kids you were dealing with, that's what they were doing. Well, th these were older guys. Oh. These, these were not kids. These guys, Pepsi and Lucky were, uh, I would say Lucky was in his 30s and Pepsi probably in his 40s. Oh. And they were good friends. They, they were kind of, uh, they helped each other out. They helped each other survive. You know, because, you know, a heroin addict, I'll tell you another story that, that happened when I was, that this, this story actually happened literally the first day I was in Harlem. Um, 
but it's when I really began to see how <coughs> how how difficult it is to be a heroin addict just from the standpoint of finances you know that's why so many of them ended up going to prison because pain like you know heroin addiction it's not just that it's not like you want to use heroin to have fun to get high when you become a heroin addict and you don't have your shot you're hurting you're in tremendous pain you're in withdrawal so I didn't know that I knew nothing about heroin addiction when I first went there so I only learned later on that how painful it is to try to give it up because I was often helping people try to kick it and so I, I started to learn that but in the beginning my first day and this this changed my life this is one of the life-changing things that happened to me I met a kid named Teddy White my first day in Harlem I'm just walking around and I met him over by Morningside Park and we just start talking he's a 19 year old high school dropout heavy heroin addict but he had he had just had a fix so he had four or five hours before he needed to worry about his next fix and we started talking most of the talking was him talking it was mostly me listening and he's paralleling the rise and fall of the Roman Empire with where the United States is going and I knew enough about the Roman Empire to know that he was on point with what he was saying about the Roman Empire but he's enlightening me and and even this I I had seen some of it because I had seen the US as racist I had seen that the way white people treat black people I had seen a lot of the the hatred that goes on uh, so I, I had seen some of this but he went further into it and he my god you know I'm I'm an Ivy League guy he's a high school dropout and he's schooling me you know and I walked away and we 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 talked for like four hours like I said mostly him talking and, and me listening and then interjecting a few things I learned so much that day and I walked away and I said holy sh I'm gonna learn a lot in this place now, that was my first day in Harlem what was the place where was it it was on the street near Morningside Park we caught each other's eyes somehow I don't know how the, I don't remember how the conversation started but uh but you would wander over there to get into conversations yeah yeah because that is a challenge Morningside Park yeah well I, I got held up at knife point by three guys three guys with knives uh, but that was a different you know this I was not in the park this time the the three night three guys with knives I was actually walking through the park then wow. and I was walking through an area where you know I just, this is gonna sound crazy but you know when you're young you think you're invincible um, one of the other guys in the Urban League had gotten knifed uh, in in uh, in Morningside Park and I deliberately after I heard the story one day I, I put twenty dollars in my pocket because I know that you have to give them something otherwise you're gonna be in trouble so I put twenty dollars in my pocket and I walked in the same spot where this guy got knifed and sure enough these three guys came out all of them had knives and again you know you, when you're young I, I didn't think you know I I wasn't afraid I, I thought it was gonna be fine and I'm not saying that I'm never afraid of things but I wasn't that day <clears throat> and I remember one of them saying uh, they, they I gave them the twenty dollars I said that's all I have and one of them said you know hurt him or knife him or something like that and the other guy said no let him go and they let me go I don't know why the hell I did that I really don't know but I was just trying I wanted to learn as much as I could and I thought I was invincible so I wanted to experience that yeah. at any rate but that's another thing but, the, but it was it was a kind of a close call there that one guy said do it yeah 
Wow. Yeah, I mean, luckily the other guy said, no, don't. Uh, but uh, with Teddy White, the 19-year-old I was telling you about, I always wish I could have found out what happened to him. I mean, he was so f***ing smart. My God, he was bright. I mean, he would have been an Ivy League kind of guy if he'd grown up in that world, you know. Uh -huh. Very smart. And I never saw him again. I, you know, it wasn't like today where you might exchange email numbers or something, you know. Uh, I never saw him again. And I always wondered what happened to him. I figured he either got killed or ended up in prison for a long time. Because, you know, when you got a heroin habit, you got to, if you don't have a steady job, you got to go out and rob people to pay your, to, to pay for your next fix. Now, what, do you, what, what goes through your mind when you hear about current heroin epidemic, what's going on now in different parts of the oh, USA? Well, it's the same, you know. Except it's a different group of people now. Yeah. Yeah, but one of the things that I, what I learned over the years, I did a lot of work with, uh, with heroin addicts and alcoholics, and I did a lot of work in prisons, with either in prisons or with people who had been in prison. And one of the things that I saw in the beginning, I saw it right away, but I wasn't sure if it was just an anomaly in the beginning. And before long, I saw that, no, it's not an anomaly, it's a reality. The people, the heroin addicts, the alcoholics, you know, the substance abusers, the people who are locked up in jail, there is a very high percentage of very sensitive people in that grouping. And I, I finally learned that, you know, sensitivity is a double-edged sword. You know, and I know that even for myself, like, uh, you know, I get more joy than a lot of people do out of seeing little kids happy, you know. But at the same time, I feel more pain than a lot of people do when I see painful things, you know. So sensitivity, sensitivity heightens your experience, good or bad. So you have, if you have people who are going through mostly uh, mostly negative challenging experiences and they're sensitive they're particularly sensitive people that's going to affect them more than it would if they were not so sensitive that's part of the reason a lot of uh, very bright sensitive people commit suicide um, it's just so painful for them it's more painful than it is for maybe the average person Anyway, so what I, what I began to see is that, you know, most of the people who start doing drugs or drinking, it's their way of self-medicating because they're in pain and they don't want to feel the pain. So they deaden themselves, numb themselves. Uh, and then before long, they're addicts, you know? And then when you're an addict, like heroin in particular, thank God I never did it. But from the people I met, very hard to get off of. Very few heroin addicts that I met were able to to free themselves of heroin. Um, very hard. Part of it that it feels so good. Hmm. This is the uh, no the good part. I mean, what is it like at best? The marijuana. I mean. The, oh, at best. I mean, I guess at best. The the, I mean, like like I said, I never did heroin. Right. But at best, I guess, you know, it's, there's probably a euphoric feeling in the beginning. But the euphoric feeling is a, uh, an answer to the pains of racism. Racism or other so things like that... Racism it, makes you feel down, mm -hmm. and then heroin makes you feel up. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And I, and I don't want to just say racism, but racism is a core of it. Because it could be, be a victim of, of humiliation or whatever. You're humiliation, saying. you know, not being able to. Well, of course, that is racism. You can't get a job. Maybe your school situation was not as good, so you, so you don't have uh, as much chance to, to benefit that way. You know, there's a lot of domestic violence, which is put many. Much of that is rooted in racism. Husband or the man, for example, uh, can't find a job, and starts beating on his family because of it or turns to drink and then beats on his family. So a lot of things are rooted in racism that might not necessarily look like racism until you get at the root causes. 
but the point is that yeah there's so much pain and along with the pain uh, and this is a big part of it a sense of hopelessness not feeling that you have the power to really change things um, that's why to go back to when I was teaching and just not just teaching but whenever I'm interacting with people whatever my whole life I'm always trying to help empower people help people to feel strong, to feel better about themselves and you know uh, it's something as a society our society does the opposite of that you know makes people feel worse about themselves the school system makes people feel worse about themselves in most ways I mean that's a conversation you know certain ways that can be discussed but generally that's what what I think happens so I was always trying to trying to do you know trying to empower people but coming back to what I was saying earlier the people who get most involved in alcoholism the people who end up in prison there's a high percentage of very sensitive people there oh. when I worked in 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 the tombs and I worked in Rikers Island I could not believe the the artwork that is going on in prison the sensitivity the the creativity that is locked up behind bars it's unbelievable you know they have artists I, it's just amazing I can't even put it in into words there's so much sensitivity besides the pain that it's causing the people who are locked up and their families society is missing out on some amazing people who are locked up behind bars you know that calls to mind uh, an item I heard today on Democracy Now in the lead, wa lead in the water Flint Michigan story that the prison was feeding the water to the prisoners and telling the prisoners the water is fine but the guards were only drinking bottled water exactly exactly yep yeah yeah it's just you know and again and this is stuff that needs to be that needs to be known you know you, when you're in high school you should be learning about the the prison system you should be learning if you if you if you're learning science it shouldn't just be you know what's on the the physics exam or the biology exam let's take a look at why why is the asthma rate in the Bronx four times the national average what's happening in 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 Flint Michigan with in Detroit with the you know the water and the housing and all these kinds of things let kids learn this uh, you know I was thinking you could have a, a curriculum for a course called uh, how to make it right or let's make it right or it's time to make it right yeah I mean I, my thing is the way that I would okay this is this is actually good because it kind of segues into something that I feel strongly about in in the school system to me every school should have like a school improvement group and, I'm, and I'll bring it back to the question that you asked in a minute but in the school improvement group it should be open to every single person in the school every student every teacher every administrator every secretary every custodian anybody in the school who wants to be a part of the school improvement group should be invited and be in the group and then part of what would happen is that that group would evaluate the conditions in the school would evaluate the current curriculum and would work on trying to make the school as good as possible all right improve whatever rules need to change improve the curriculum in whatever way the group decides and it needs to be done in a way it's got to be fully democratic so that let's say for example let's say you and I are on the on the committee the school improvement committee but these four kids over here and this uh, custodian over here they would like to be on the committee but they don't have the time okay we have to have a vehicle in place so that they can have input also so we create a vehicle with maybe in today's world it might be a uh, uh, a place on the website where you can write in you know your ideas uh, and in the old days it might have been one of those boxes like a suggestion box but there has to be some vehicle and it could be like in homeroom classes where 
where the home where a representative uh, you know represents the people in the homeroom in the class who can't make it to the thing but the point is that everybody's got to have a voice everybody has got to be told that we want your voice you know we need your voice the more perspectives we have on all the issues in our school the closer we're going to be to to its truth uh, John Stuart Mill I always remember this is a paraphrase but the uh, philosopher John Stuart Mill English guy he said years ago he said a man can never know nowadays you'd say a person right but so a man can never know if his opinion is right or wrong but if he has kept his mind open, and if he has considered the issue from every single perspective that he can possibly consider it from, then he has a right to think that he is probably closer to the truth than he would be if he didn't do that. And that's, that's my, you know, that resonated so strongly with me. I learned that 50 years ago and it stayed with me. Um, be open to it all. Yeah, exactly. You've got to be open to everything, take it all in, evaluate it, weigh it out, and then see what you think is, is accurate. So in a school system, in a school or a school system, every person involved has got to be invited to be a part of the conversation. Because no two people can have the same exact perspective on something. You can agree on things, but there's going to be something, like you and I agree on a lot of things. But there are some things that you and I have a somewhat different perspective on. So we need to hear your perspective and my perspective, and his, and hers, and hers, you know? So, if you have a school improvement group, it's got to be that every single person, the high academic achiever, the special ed kid who has trouble reading, the, the, the well-behaved kids, the not well-behaved kids, the, everybody, every single person in the, in the school system or the particular school, whichever way you're doing it, has got to be invited to be a part of the school improvement group. You know, and the only rule is as long as you take part in a respectful way. You come to the meetings, as many as you can, you participate, you know, respectfully. So, how about we transfer that? We have a city government yes, improvement yes, group. Yes, right? yes, yes, absolutely. There needs to be community groups like this too. And then so that, for example, let's say this Morningside, Manhattanville area, we would have that same thing, open to people of all ages, all ethnicities, whoever wants to be a part of it, come together. And then what you do, and then have, make it a national and an international thing where the kids from this school here in New York City on 107th Street are connected. They can find out what a group of kids in Warsaw are saying about that same topic, you know, or in some place else. Uh, so you may, you know, have your own individual piece going on for your local area, <clears throat> but then share ideas and get solutions from, from people all over the place. Um, at any rate, to come back to it, what you were saying, so if I'm in a classroom, if I'm a teacher in a classroom, um, I would have, in the same way that you would have a process involved, like with the school improvement group, one of the first things that you would do is you would create some kind of a, an evaluation process to see where you stand right now. Soon after I got to Stevenson High School in the Bronx, which is a very interesting place, the Bronx and Stevenson High School. Uh, I started the Stevenson Improvement Club and, and it was open to uh, parents also. All the people I said, anybody connected to the school who wanted to join and, and parents too. And one of our first orders of business, and this is on the website blog kind of thing that you talked about. One of our first orders of business was we agreed as a group that we needed a, uh, a student evaluation, a student assessment of what they think of the school. And it had to come, 
you know, lots of times a, a survey, that's the word I'm trying to think of, a survey. Lots of times when there's a survey of students, the questions come from adults and, and the survey ends up being kind of bogus because it's not getting at what the kids really feel. So we knew that this had to come mostly from the students. So the students in the Stevenson Improvement Club sat down. We adults were a part of the conversation, uh, but basically they made the decision. And they decided, I think there were 25, uh, 25 statements that we created on the student survey. So it all came from the students. And it was the way we did it was one of those strongly agree, agree, not sure, disagree, strongly disagree. And then at the bottom of the page, we left uh, space for the kids to say anything they wanted to say, anything they wanted to add to that. Um, and we also asked them to write down any uh, extracurricular clubs or new courses that they'd like to see. Anyway, so we had this survey. And this has got to be one of the first things you do, because you have to, you know, if you bring your car to the mechanic to get it fixed, the first thing the mechanic's got to do is make an assessment. What's working, what needs to be fixed. All right, so we did this. Luckily, the principal was in favor of this and was supportive. And he gave us permission to actually do this, uh, administer the survey in English classes or language arts classes so that every kid in the school who was there that day would have uh, the opportunity to fill out the survey. Um, that was, you know, a lot of, a lot of principals wouldn't, wouldn't do that, but he did. And so we ended up with, um, I think it was, it was almost 1,800 surveys filled out. That's a lot. So this was a good representative, you know, uh, cross section. What's and the total population? The total population, you know, I don't know what it was because um, it was it was much higher than that. Uh, but How a lot of kids were class? absent. Uh, huh? How many in the class? Well, uh, again, there on on paper or how many bodies in the class? Because that's what I was going to say. Oh, yeah. Like the the population, I saw supposedly Stevenson is one of the biggest schools in the Bronx, and the population was. I saw one time they said 5,400, another time it said 4,800, but that's on paper. A lot of these kids never showed up, you know. So the uh, never showed up. Yeah, or hardly ever showed up. So anyway, there are kids run around town that never show up at high school, and what are they doing? At, to be honest with you, at Stevenson, back then, a lot of the kids were hanging outside the school. Oh. Just didn't go in. <laughs> They'd go to school and hang out outside. So I don't know. In fact, years later, I thought to myself, I made a mistake, because on that day, the day we did the survey, because we did it all on one day, I said I should have taken a surveys out to the kids outside and had them fill it out also. And I, it didn't occur to me until years later. But we did get a real cross-section of, you know, uh, very good cross-section. And, and was there some useful information when you got us in? There was very, there was out, outstandingly useful information, but not a whole lot came of it, all right? Um, we ended up, we wrote up a, the Stevenson Improvement Club student survey results. Ah. Which, which is on that thing. I'll show it to you if you haven't seen it. Uh, and it was very, you know, and one of the things is very, very strong. Uh, and one of the things that, that I'd like to see today happen is have the same process. I'd like to see schools do the same thing. Get a, start a, start a school improvement group. Um, you know, sometimes I think it would be interesting for them to use the same exact uh, questions that Stevenson kids use. And then other times I think do the same process, but use the questions that are 
but that's probably the better way. Do the same process where it comes from the kids, um, but have it be for the, you know, whatever is relevant to, the, to their school situation right now. That's really what it should be. And what would be interesting would be to see how many of the, the questions on the survey end up being pretty much the same anyway. Because a lot of them were things like, there's not enough respect between students and teachers. Uh -huh. There's not enough relevant courses. The bathrooms are dirty. Uh, you know, things like that would be true. How about, how about complaining about the punishment system? Um, yes, there was that too. There was that too. I remember they did feel the kids who were disrupting classes should not be allowed to disrupt classes. But at the same time, the idea was that kids felt that the kids who were being disruptive, they wanted them to be respected too. They didn't want them to be allowed to mess with the kids who wanted to listen to the teacher, but they wanted them to not just be treated, not just be kicked out, but they wanted them to be somehow respected and, and cared about. I can't remember exactly how it happens. I'll, I'll look it up and, and show that to you. What, what about it was difficult for the school administration to accept? Um, because it was very critical of the school administration. You know, to me it shouldn't have been. And, we, and, and in a way, you know, the principal, the principal who okayed, <clears throat> uh, who okayed us doing the survey was replaced at the end of that year by a new principal. Not, I'm sure it wasn't, I, I, I don't really think it was connected to that, I'm quite sure it wasn't. But that principal would have been very open to getting the results. The new principal, and I never quite understood this because the new principal was coming into a building that he had nothing to do with creating. So when he saw all the things that the kids felt needed to change, I don't think he should have taken it personally. Sure. Right? But somehow, I don't, I don't exactly know what happened inside of him, but he was not supportive of, of the things that needed to be fixed. And um, so a lot did not get done. I did, and I didn't stay at Stevenson myself too much longer after that. But you were in touch with people who maintained the struggle yeah. for a while? Yeah, and, and, and not much got done. And I'll tell you something else, and part of, part of this is on me, because uh, I sent what we did, I actually took, um, I took a leave of absence to compile all this stuff. I lived off my credit card and I took almost a full year off because we had, yeah, the number just came to me. Now we had 1,798 surveys filled out. So I had to do the math on all of these surveys to find the percentages who felt this, the percentages who felt that. I did all of that and then I, I broke it down not only by percentages but by, by grouping. Ninth grade honors kids felt this. Did Ninth you use grade. Computer? Hmm? Did you use a no, computer? No, no computers back then. I, you know, I typed up the results because everything was handwritten. I'm a very slow typist. I typed up, my, the original report when I made it, when I wrote it up, had 102 typewritten pages. Um, and it was all, it was, the, it was the statistical results and then it was the comments that the kids wrote. Like I would take a representative amount of, uh, for example, let's say take, take counseling. One of the problems was that the counselors, kids felt the counselors didn't have enough time for them and often that they didn't listen to them. Those are two of the big complaints. So I would take comments that the kids wrote in the comment section that uh, supported the numbers that came on the checkoff section, where you checked off strongly agree or disagree, that kind of thing. And so do, in doing that, it ended up, like I said, with, uh, I guess it was 102 pages. And I said, whoa, this is too much. You know, I can't send this around, you know. 
So I shortened it. I don't remember what it came out ended up being. I think in I think in the end it became 40 something pages. I just cut I just cut I, I kept the same percentages. You know, like if 9 out of 10 felt this way, maybe in the beginning I had 27 and 3, so I cut it down to 9 and 1. So I kept the same percentages but just but you know, lowered the volume of the uh, report. <laughs> and and then I Xeroxed about 50 copies and I sent it out to the mayor, chancellor, newspapers, um, college presidents. Sent out about, wow. about 50 copies. Oh boy. Yeah. And I'm thinking, and here's, here's my naivety again. I'm thinking the newspapers are going to eat this up. They're going to make a big deal out of it. Nothing. Nothing. I did get, I can't remember the number now, I got about 20 written responses. Thank you, this is very interesting. But no follow-up. No, you know, no big deal at all. And, and the part that's on me is that I should have, like when I got a response from a reporter, but they didn't want to find out more, I should have written back or called them and said, okay, you said this was a good thing, can't we do something with it? The public needs to learn this. And I didn't do that. You know, that was, you know, that, that's fully on me. Because there were a lot of things, even the thing, even the people who didn't respond, like I said, I sent it out to about 50 people or organizations, got around 20 responses. Excuse me. I should have gotten back to the 30 who didn't respond also and say, did you get this? Did you read it? You know, don't you think this is important? Um, and I didn't do that. So one of the thoughts that I have now, and you know, there's, there's a lot of things I'm working on right now. So when I say now, it might not be immediate. But I would like to try to bring this back to the public and somehow make it, uh, release it to the public. The numbers of how it's scored are not so much the issue that these are issues in schools in general that counselors aren't treating the kids right. They're not giving enough time, they're not listening. You know. Yeah. That, that's a general proposition that you don't need a seven out of six complaint about it. No, but I think people need to see it. I don't think that the general public um, knows that the counseling system is not really helping much. You know, I think if they did, now, in all fairness, it's not always the counselor's fault. Like at Stevenson, the counselors were, the main job they had was to program students. That was a very time consuming job. So they didn't have time to sit and counsel students. And they had workloads of like 500 kids. How are you gonna be one counselor for 500 kids and be able to serve those kids? Can you hold that thought and I'll run and get a sweater? Are you cold too? No, I'm okay, but I can see, yeah, I, you know. Uh, let me stop.
got ourselves a neighborhood chat going on here, folks. Uh, we got a fella here who devoted his life to the education profession. Uh, we are in the neighborhood of some monuments to the educational efforts of education, about education uh, in the neighborhood. <laughs> We have uh, the uh, University of what do they call that place up at 120th Street, 122nd? Columbia. School of Education. Columbia Teachers College. There you go, that's the one. <clears throat> they actually went the next step from education to teachers college. Yeah. yeah. So you went that way, huh? And uh, I was saying earlier, I mean, one of the precious things I found in the act of teaching, there is self-validation. And that validation you see as valuable in a kid. You have the generosity of spirit to lay some on because you have already felt the joys of a whole bunch. Just the joys of teaching have that reward of validation mm -hmm. which teaches you to respect it to the point of making sacrifices for its maintenance. <laughs> but we're talking about a trip. We're talking about a way of the head that good teachers do have as their payoff. They'd stay young forever if they can just stay in touch with the, um, well, what we came to call it toward the end of our wanderings was opening to all of it. It's a way to be open to all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the system is set up in such a way that a lot of good teachers, you know, you can't, they don't always let you teach in the style that is best, that works best for you, you know. As I was saying earlier, most of the time, like when I was stuck having to just follow the set curriculum and was told to do it in a certain way, I was not a good teacher. You know, I was only a good teacher when I had the freedom to create the class the way that I knew the kids really needed it to be. Well, one of the values of our making this kind of TV, which is basically YouTube, is to make the point now. You were saying you only got to do it your way about some small percentage, 10%. And so that is a a painful daily life to go ahead and go through the motions teaching something you're uncomfortable doing. I can imagine coming home after a day like that just feeling totally present. Yeah. 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 I, I, uh, I have often said that unless I get hit by a truck or something, if, if I die sort of relatively natural causes, I think my time with the Board of Ed is going to have, I think I'm going to die sooner. I think I'm going to die sooner than I would have if I did not have that type of stressful job for so many years. And we were talking about the, the survey and one of the things, one of the big things that came up in the survey was that the students didn't feel the counselors had enough time for them, didn't listen to them enough. But part of the thing I was saying is that to a large degree, it was because the counselors had too big a caseload. You know, they had hundreds of students to deal with. And they also were forced to be the programmers for the students. It's important for the public to know that the counseling situation doesn't really work in a lot of schools. The counselors themselves would, um, would complain that they just didn't have the time to really counsel kids. And part of the reason, number one, they had too many, too many uh, students in their caseload. Um, hundreds. They had hundreds of students in their caseload. And so, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, you know, right away, one counselor with hundreds of students, obviously you can't devote a whole lot of time to each kid. But then on top of that, they had, they were put in charge of the programming. So not just, um, you know, I mean, a counselor does need to be involved in programming in the sense of helping a kid figure out which courses are best suited based on, you know, his or her interests and needs. I would guess by now they figured out a better way to do it with computers and stuff. I don't know. 
I, I would not necessarily assume that, to tell you the truth. Because this was only, this was when I was at Stevenson. It was 30 years ago. Oh, Pounds. were some of the choices the program had to Oh, I, I don't remember. Well, they were tough. It's like you really should know the kid before you make the call. Um, I don't even know if that's true because for the most part, most of the curriculum in the school was, you know, was not a relevant curriculum anyway. You know, it was more about what's required for for uh, graduation. Because it, occasionally it happened that a kid thought he or she graduated and then found out two days before graduation that they missed the course because the counselor forgot to tell them they had to take this course. It was more about about fulfilling graduation requirements. Because most of the curriculum was not, you know, the curriculum was designed by people in Albany or somewhere else. It was not designed with input from the community or from the kids. So it was a pretty irrelevant curriculum. When I would teach, whenever I had the kind of course, when I had the freedom to teach the way I wanted to, one of the things I always did is at the end of each week, I would ask the kids, how did you feel about this week? What did you like that we did? What did you think we could have done better? What would you like to do more of? And it was an ongoing thing. I always made it a part of the curriculum. It's the process as you go along. And that's what should be happening in a school. You should always be evaluating what's going on. And you're developing social skills and talking out loud to authority. Yes. Yes, you're learning how to, you learn, you're being listened to. And the thing about being listened to is that when you are listened to, the message you're getting is that you have something worthwhile to say, which right. translates to, I'm worthwhile. Validation. Validation, as you were saying earlier. It's the validation of your worth as a human being, which then makes you perform a lot better. So anyway, I'd like to go back to what I was saying about if you have a school improvement thing, the whole curriculum would be designed with input from everybody in the in the uh, improvement group. Yeah. So you'd have input from kids, you'd have input direct or indirect probably from community members because to me in a school system the door should school should be kind of the door should be open and the community and the school should be working together. So there should be community people allowed and encouraged to be in the school. There should be community people in the school who have an opportunity to talk with the kids about things that they think are important. There should be internships and apprenticeships going on. The system is so bad there's very little of it at all? Yes. Yeah, very little of community involvement. Feeling, you describe some of the agonies the teachers are feeling that they are denied, they have to teach curriculum they don't believe in their hearts are worth teaching. I can describe it more from 10 years ago when I retired because I know nowadays the teachers are really upset about all the testing that they're forced to do. And one of the things that I talk about with current educators, some of them will say, stop all this testing, give us our schools back. And what I respond to with that is, our schools were no good even before all this testing. Our schools still did not belong to the kids and the community even before we were doing all this testing that you're talking about. Because the testing just started right around the time that I, that I retired. I retired in 05. And that's around when they started getting really heavy with the, the testing stuff. So all the time since that, these 10 or so years since then, I haven't been in the system, so I haven't experienced it that way. But we can guess what, what a pain the tests are. What yeah. the pains are is like more impositions on what they insist is happening. It's hard enough to teach without all that trouble. Yeah, yeah. But the, the point that I, that I make is that even without the testing, the curriculum that we were forced to throw at the kids, which was irrelevant and boring, it was a setup for the kids to fail. Can you give an example of uh, how, how it could have been better? What I would have done, first of all, I would have, in the, in the school improvement group, there would have been a curriculum committee. And that curriculum committee would have been open to any person, every person in the school community who wanted to be a part of it. You'd probably end up with 15 or 20 people. 
But if you had 300 people who wanted to be a part of the curriculum committee, you could do that. You, you take whatever number you have and you figure out a way logistically to make that work. And in the curriculum committee, then you would have input. Each person, as I was saying earlier with the John Stewart Mill quote, you know, the more perspectives you have about anything, the closer you come to its truth. So the more perspectives you have about curriculum and what I think curriculum should include and you think curriculum should include and she thinks curriculum should include, the more that you have, the closer you're going to come to creating a curriculum that works for the students, that helps them become more empowered, that helps them learn how to deal with the real world that exists right now and also helps them to learn how to figure out how to make tomorrow's world a better world. Because you got to do both of those things. You need to know how to deal with reality, but you have to have a vision to make reality become better. Uh, especially when there's so many things going on in our world that are destructive. The curriculum committee, part of the school improvement group, would create, would create curriculum with input from everybody in the building. But also within the classroom, like for example, if I, I were teaching today, I would want to offer a course called Solutions. And solutions would be open to any kid in the, in the building. And to be honest with you, I'd also like to include community members and have them in the class too. But let's just say for now we're talking, in, we're talking students in the school. The solutions course would be open to anybody who felt like finding solutions to any one or more problems that are current in our community, our nation, and or our world. And when the kids come in to class, the first part of it would be a brainstorming where kids have an opportunity to list all the things that they think need fixing. Just, just brainstorming. We'll put it down on, on, on the board or on construction paper or whatever that stuff is called. And compile this whole list of things that the students feel need to be worked on and then compile that list and then start discussing each of the uh, individual things on the brainstorm list and have the students prioritize which are the programs that uh, which are the problems that we feel strongest about fixing right now which are the ones we want to work on and then let kids work on whatever problem they're particularly interested in. Um, so it might be a political thing, it, it, it might be police brutality, it might be finances, uh, it might be the, uh, the health situation, you know, the um, not having enough money to, to take care of the fact that my you know, my, my father has cancer and, you know, I, who knows what it might be. It might be domestic violence. It might be a sense of hopelessness that a lot of people have. It, whatever it would be, it would come from the kids. And the kids would then uh, be allowed to work on whichever uh, areas they want to work on. Okay, and they could work on them individually um, for the most part, I would probably encourage them to, to work in small groups with other people who, who are interested in the same issue. But the point is the curriculum would come from the kids. It wouldn't be that you would have a set thing in the beginning saying, okay, the solutions course is going to deal with this, 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 and this. The kids themselves will create what the course is going to be and you evaluate it as you go along. You know, at, at the end of the week, uh, you have two things. You, you have a kind of a, a suggestion box or a, piece on, a, a place on the website, the, the classroom website, or have, you have something where whenever a kid gets an idea, even if it's three o'clock in the morning, he or she can post it so it can be discussed later on. But you also have a thing where every week at the end of the week, for example, this is how I did it. Somebody else might do it differently. But at the end of the week, 
I would sit down and say, okay, what did you like about the, the, the past week? What would you like to change? What do you want to do about such and such? And do you have any new ideas? So you always have an ongoing evaluation process. And you're teaching kids to assess things as they are, to assess things that just happened, and to be creative about ways to move forward from wherever you are. It's about how can I as an individual and we as a group make our lives, our families' lives, our neighbors' lives better. And neighbors including not only people in our immediate community but our nation and our world. The solutions course would attract people who have a sensitivity to wanting to, to make a difference in the world, you know? But contrary to the way our society is and our schools are now, in this situation, the kids would be really empowered. They would not be feeling hopeless and frustrated. They would be feeling hopeful. You know, they would be feeling, wow, look at this. We're actually doing something. We're creating something. Uh, and I'm worthwhile. I have something to offer. I was able to bring this thing to the class and they liked it. It's very important. One of the things that we all struggle with is wanting to feel that our being alive makes a difference in the world. You know, that, that we're significant, that we belong. We don't have that in our society generally. We don't have that in our schools. We don't have that sense of belonging. Being a part of a group. We need more positive ways for kids to be a part of the group. And, um, and working on finding solutions to things is a really good way to feel that sense of belonging and feel that sense of uh, accomplishment, of, of being significant. When you think of democracy, you have a lot of faith in discussion. And what I'm hearing is an ability that you have to lead discussions. Yeah, I mean, I would say so. And I think it really comes from the sense of knowing that every person is important. And every person has a perspective that is unique. Every one of us has different strengths, different weaknesses, and different ways of looking at at what everything. The thing is that we're entitled to our differences. Yes. And not only are we entitled to them, but they should be honored. You know, because it offers something new. The fact that you can teach me something that I don't know, that's a great thing. And I am thankful to you for that. And I'm thankful to her and him and, and, and them for being able to teach me what they can teach me that I don't know.